Welcome everyone. Um, good evening. Um, welcome to this um, NSTS regional lead um, series. I'm Ronald, um, one of the regional leads of the um, NSTS. And today we are going to have a webinar covering major trauma um, surgery. And we are very fortunate to have Mr. Um, Mr. Bates to join us today. So Mr. Bates is a um, consultant TNO surgeon based in Royal London's hospital. And he's also a um, senior clinical lecturer at um, Queen Mary Un University of London and um, teaching for the orthopedic trauma series MSc course. Um, can, yeah, Mr. Bates, welcome. Great, are we done? You finished with yeah. the eulogy now? Yeah. <laughs> awesome, awesome. Sometimes, yeah. Some people, fortunately not me, but some people that just goes on forever and ever and ever. They go, oh, yeah. he's, he's done this and he's done that. Yeah. And he's done this, he's done that. Oh, tragically oh, shot, yeah. Me. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Everyone's nodded off by the time you started. Okay, brilliant. Well, thanks, guys. Thank you so much for inviting me. I'm really honored to uh, speak to you all. Um, I'm starting off with pelvic, pelvic ring injuries, and then it goes into other kind of orthopedic stuff uh, that's kind of a, a bit unexpected. So just, just roll with it. It's a talk about trauma, orthopedic trauma, bones, basically broken bones. And we're gonna start off with fairly high energy, and we're gonna whittle it down into slightly lower energy later on, all right? Pelvic ring injuries. When I say pelvic ring injuries, <clears throat> what I mean by that is fractures of the, of the of the pelvic ring, which is basically uh, when you think it's basically the sacrum here, either side of the sacrum, it's the pubic pubis here, or either side of the pubic rami, and sometimes the ileum as well. It you as as opposed to acetabular fractures, which are fractures of the hip socket. Okay, so uh, pelvic ring is the kind of the pelvisy bit, acetabulum is the hip socket. And now sometimes like in this scenario, you can get both, but we're talking about pelvic ring injuries here. Okay. And those are classified. So you're classified into lateral compression, AP compression and vertical shear. And so I'll just, um, I'll just walk you through those. Uh, so a lateral compression, by far the commonest, by far the commonest. And <laughs> I love this girls. I, th I think this, 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 um, this diagram was, dr was drawn, this picture was drawn back in the 1980s, I think. She's wearing kind of a 1980s top and she's got a haircut like, um, like Princess Diana used to have. So I think, I think it was, that's when it was illustrated. Um, but what it shows is, is lateral compression and the point about lateral compression is, is it's by far the commonest because if you can imagine a bus coming towards you and you know the bus is going to hit you, what do you do? Do you like stand up and like face the bus and like go, right, come on, Mr. Bus, uh, you know, head on? No, you don't. What you do is you'd like stand to the side like this. You sort of brace yourself to the side and you you actually stick your ass out a bit. You kind of stick your ass out as, as the kind of the thing that's going to make the contact with the bus. So that's why you're, you're, you, uh, you end up with an, an LC type injury. Um, and that's what it looks like on an X-ray. You can see in this scenario, uh, what can you see down here, guys? What can you see down here? Can you see anything there? What am I looking at there? Maybe you can't use your voices on this. Uh, could, are, we able, are, we able to, are we able to, people able to unmute themselves and scream out? No, unfortunately. No worries, okay. But if you could, you'd be screaming binder, pelvic binder. That's the pelvic, that's the, like the lasso you put around people's pelvis to stop them bleeding. You can see in this scenario, uh, this patient's probably been a little bit over compressed. You see uh, this pubis coming around here, that's the pubic symphysis right there. And that should really be lined up with this guy down here. So the patient's been a little bit over squeezed by the binder, but you can nicely see uh, the lateral compression going on there, can't you? You've been hit from their right side. That's lateral compression. And there are various different flavors. There's a type one, a type two, and a type three of increasing severity, which I won't bore you with. Okay, there's AP compression. That's the one that, that's the picture that you class classically get shown for an AP compression, like being squeezed front to back. But more commonly, AP compression 
<coughs> fractures where your legs get forcibly splayed open. So if you imagine this guy with the horse landing between his legs, or you can imagine someone on a motorbike with their, one of their legs gets caught against something as they're moving forwards and their legs get forcibly opened up. Um, and that's what it looks like in a model. You can see the uh, left hemi pelvis has been pulled out to the side and you can see this like sacroiliac joint here has been widened up, hasn't it? You can see that. Yeah, and the symphysis at the front, of course, that has also popped as well. Um, and that's your classic open book fracture. You can see why it's called an open book because it's opened up like a book. Um, and the symphysis is disrupted and one of the SI joints has gone. One or both of the SI joints has gone. And again, they come in three flavors, AP1, AP2, AP3, of increasing severity. And finally, you've got vertical shear. And usually, usually this is a fall from standing height. Uh, sorry, a fall from height. <clears throat> and you can see what's happened. The left hemi pelvis has been driven northwards. Um, and it's usually a fall from height like this. And it very much depends what you land on. If you land on your butt, on your ass, you know when you sit down, the thing you sit on is your ischial tuberosity. That thing there, that's your ischial tuberosity. And so if you land on your ass, your, your, your pelvis takes all the way up and through, and so you get a vertical shear pelvic fracture. If you land on your feet, you don't necessarily get a pelvic fracture. You can get, you tend to get calcaneal fractures or tibial plateau fractures, or, or you break your legs. You, do, you, you may, may be spared a pelvic fracture. Anyway, it's a fall from height, and that's what it looks like on x-ray. Interesting though, that, uh, that that's, a, and I, will, I think we'll come back to this, come back to that picture. So classification, is it even useful? First poll, guys, on the ready with your pens, you know what I mean, your metaphorical pens. How useful is classification? Guys, can you stick up the first poll about classification? How useful is it to classify pelvic injuries in the emergency department? Massively useful, pretty useful, not particularly, utterly useless. Generally speaking, guys, I'm, I'm a fairly polar kind of guy, so it's probably either the top one or the bottom one. <laughs> <laughs> but you probably already voted by that. Anyway, uh, so people are going for the pretty useful. Okay, great. Uh, like it. I like it. Nice. Uh, let's lose that. So, sorry. Boom. Okay, so what, what would it be useful for? Would it, does it predict mortality? Does it predict blood loss? Does it predict associated injuries? Well, and the, the, I've just picked one, one uh, uh, paper here, but there are, there are actually a bunch of these. When you look at all of the various injuries that you have, lateral compression, AP compression, vertical shear, and the various flavors of them, actually not none of them, not one of them individually predicts all of those, all of those things. If you look at all of them together, so that the, the, the more severe ones are to the right of your screen, they're the ones I've put in the red, red box, then yes, if you compare the twos and threes and the vertical shears, you clump them all together and you, you say, does that, does that predict blood loss and mortality? Yes, it does. But individual ones, is a vertical shear more bad than an AP3 or an LC3? No, it's not. They're all of, of um, uh, you know, they, they can all be really, really severe. So the answer to the question really is not very useful or utterly useless in the, in the it's, I think probably number three was the correct answer is not particularly useful. Um, because they don't really, because, because the fact of the matter is you can bleed to death from any pelvic fracture. Is the fracture classification useful when we're trying to fix the pelvis? Yes, definitely super useful, massively useful, couldn't be more useful. But in terms of like your management in the emergency department, it doesn't actually change whether it's a vertical shear or an LC1. All right, on we go. Going back to that vertical shear I showed you, sometimes when you look at a, so I'm sure you, you guys are looking at that vertical shear pelvic x-ray and thinking, hmm, yeah, I think I can see where the break is. Let, let's just have a look at that, shall we? So you've got a, you've got a broken bit up here through the through the um, through the, the, the uh, up through the sacral alar, and you've got a break down here through the pubic ramus. Okay, but sometimes it's quite hard to work out on the a, on a straight AP view like you get in X, in, in X ray um, uh, exactly what's going on. Now, yes, we use CTs, but 
the classical way of viewing pelvic ring injuries is using inlet and outlet views. And I just wanted to show you these, just give you an idea of that. Let's start with the inlet view because it's the most obvious. Here is the fracture running up through the sacral alar right there, okay? And on the inlet view, which is slightly tilted, you can see it's tilted in, so we're looking sort of straight into the pelvis here. You can see really nicely that step, can't you? Where it goes, uh, and then it goes, uh, and then it goes right like there, that step um, where the whole pelvis has shifted back. So that's an inlet view, and that's what we get. That's one of the views. And the other one we get is called an outlet view. And this is the pelvis has now been tilted forwards. It's like we're looking almost over the top of the pelvis. And now, again, you can see uh, that deformity coming on. There's the top of the sacral alar. There's the bottom of the sacral alar. And there's the fracture line coming through there. Yeah. And you can see that on the other side, on the main, on the main film, there's the top of the sacral alar there. There's the bottom right there. And here's the fracture line coming through there. Can you see that? See the top there, the bottom there, and the fracture lines passing through the middle. We'll come back to that in a minute. So inlet outlet views demonstrate pelvic displacement. Great. Okay, so you've got a nasty pelvic, pelvic fracture. What do you do? And there are two aspects to fixing someone's pelvis. One is pelvic reduction and one is pelvic fixation. Um, just so you're just to be absolutely clear what is reduction reduction is putting it back where it belongs right so if you if you've got a dislocated shoulder reduction is putting it back in joint if you've got a a fracture that's bent reduction is pulling it straight okay so reduction of a pelvic fracture is putting it back where it belongs fixation is putting metalwork into it Weirdly, I'm going to start with pelvic fixation because it's kind of easier to conceptualize for, the, for this particular topic. So we're going to start over here. What is pelvic fixation? Well, there are two flavors in, in, of internal fixation. One of them is open internal fixation. In other words, you're fixing things with metal plates and screws on the inside. Um, so you're, you, and to do that, you've got to make these big like uh, like what we call surgical approaches. In other words, you've got to make big cuts through the skin, through the soft tissues. And because the pelvis is a deep structure, like buried in lots of muscle, it can be quite difficult to get at. Uh, and so um, open internal fixation is all very well, but it does carry with it the, the potential for infection and soft tissue problems. Uh, that's open plating. You can see they've plated the sacroiliac joints here. You can see that there's a sacroiliac joint running down there and running down there. And you can see they put these plates across, across, across on both sides. And at the front, you can also see there's this plate running down here where they fix the symphysis. Um, uh, alternative, there's, there's another one. Again, they've, they've put a plate across the back of the sacrum and they put a plate across the front of the, of the pubis as well. Uh, with metal plates and screws uh, and that's posterior sacral plating so if you if you if you feel behind you um feeling your little in the small of your back just below the small of your back you can feel your posterior superior iliac spine feel that on yourself now reach behind yourself and you feel the bony lump at the back there's two of them one on either side one here and one here and if you're going to plate someone's pelvis at the back, it goes just below that, just underneath here. Um, uh, so that's open sacral plating. Uh, or alternatively, you can use spinal pelvic fixation where you have these, uh, the, the, where the plating is not resist restricted just to the pelvis, but it goes actually up onto the spine as well. The, these things are called pedicle screws, these guys here. And that, that one's going into L5, or L4 rather. This is going into L5. And these guys are then going to the ileum, and there's a string of a bar of metal linking all of those guys up on both sides. So you end up with what's called spinopelvic fixation. It goes from the spine down to the pelvis. And that's for the really, really nasty vertical shears where uh, they're totally smash rude. Okay, so that's open internal fixation. Then you've got external fixation. Honestly, we don't use X fixes very much anymore because they are just a, uh, they, A, they don't help hold the pelvis particularly well. Uh, I mean, there is an X fix, but the downside of X fixes is that they, 
the Xfix pins pass out really, really quickly. You can see because they've got lots of tissue around them. They, they, all the skin tends to necrose. You know, this uh, this sort of horrible uh, uh, picture here happens after you know, literally after a few weeks. So uh, we do our best not to use Xfixes where possible. Alternatively, you can go for percutaneous fixation, and there is lots of uh, that's what. That's what percutaneous fixation looks like. You can see you're putting, putting screws in, but they're going in through tiny little holes. You can see, if I zoom you in here, you can see uh, down here, there's the clip. See those little skin clips down, down the bottom there? See that? Those are skin clips. Uh, you know, so you've put this, these, these, these screws in through a very, very small incision, um, and, but stabilize the pelvis nonetheless. And this is our preferred technique, if possible, if you can get it properly reduced. And there are lots of flavors of, of those types of screw. You've got these things called iliosacral screws, which go across. So this here in, in the sacrum is the, is the S1 foramen there, that's S1. And then below that, you've got S2, there's S2. So the idea is to shoot your screw. This one goes above the S, S1, between, just above S1. This one goes between S1 and S2. And that, that's what it looks like on outlet view. And the one above it is what it looks like on an inlet view. The out, uh, inlet outlet view is the ones we use in theatre. <clears> There's <throat> a thing called a posterior column screw, which goes behind the hip socket. This guy here is the hip socket right there. Um, so uh, that, 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 that goes down there. You've got, uh, and if it goes the other way, it's called a butt screw because it goes up through your, literally through your ischial tuberosity, through your, through your ass. Um, there's the anterior column screw, which goes above, you can see your, your hip joint right there, uh, just coming down here, and that goes over the top of that, down the pubic ramus. Um, and this is called an LC2 screw, don't ask why it's called that, uh, and that runs literally from front to back. It goes right the way from your anterior superior iliac spine, sorry, your anterior inferior iliac spine, this guy here, right the way through to your posterior uh, superior iliac spine, which is the one you were just feeling earlier on your back. And this thing's called an infix. An infix is, is, uh, is actually used by using spinal hardware where you've got these screws, these things called pedicle screws, this guy and this guy, and a metal bar that connects the two. But the metal bar is inserted underneath the skin. So uh, you make an incision on one side or an incision on the other, and you put the, uh, the, the, the bolts down, and then you thread this bar underneath the skin, connecting the two bolts up and lock it off. So it's basically like an X-fix, isn't it? A bit like the X-fix I showed you earlier, except you don't get all those pin side problems because it's all buried underneath the skin. Those two turrets that are sticking out, those get, those, those get taken off at the end of the operation, and you just end up with something that looks a bit like that. So you've got this bar sitting under the skin and the two screws going to the pelvis. Honestly, in most young patients, we take them out, but um, uh, it, it stabilizes the pelvis really well with the screws at the back as well. So that's all percutaneous. In other words, minimally invasive pelvic surgery. What about reduction? Because obviously you don't want to fix the pelvis in a bad position. Why not? Well, I want you to imagine that one of your ischial tuberosities is at a different height from the other one. Yeah, so you're sitting, you're sitting down now, and if you feel underneath your butt, you can feel your ischial tuberosities. Imagine one of them was like an inch higher than the other. You'd end up just falling over. You end up like, you know, literally just, you can't sit down properly. You get this, what's called a sitting imbalance. And also one of your legs would be, the, would be a different length as well. So um, pelvic malunion, in other words, healing in a bad position is a bad thing. Uh, so there's lots of ways you can reduce a pelvis. You can have an open reduction. And these are, again, these are, as I was saying earlier, these are ways of, of doing open uh, surgery to the pelvis. Uh, and, um, but the problem with a closed reduction, in other words, uh, in other words, not making bigger, big, big approaches, doing it all percutaneously, is that often you don't get a very good reduction and you fix them in a bad position. And you can see this patient, uh, this is a probably you probably call this an inlet view, but you can see there's a huge step right here. Can you see that step? It's exactly the same step I was showing you earlier on. They really haven't. There's lots of metal work in there, and there's an X fix on, and there's screws knocking around, but they haven't actually reduced it very well. And you can see how the whole the spine runs up and down like this, but the pelvis is kind of going off at an angle over here, isn't it? It's kind of all squiffy and wonky. So. Uh, 
fixing pelvises in a bad position is a bad thing. So how do we do it? Well, you can use you can use traction uh, to, to 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 pull it down. And this is a this is a device that we use at the London. Uh, something I learned in the back in the US is a thing called a star frame. It's a pretty crazy looking beast, um, but it. <laughs> And basically what happens is you stabilize. Do you see the, on this side of the pelvis, on, on this side, you can see there are these two pins. There's one pin coming in there, another pin coming in there. What those do is those stabilize the left side of the pelvis to the table to literally fix it to the operating table. And then the other side, you can use these drivers, these kind of like, they're like pushers. Uh, and he's kind of, sorry, he's kind of pushing in that direction. And this guy's pulling, oops, pulling in this direction. So it kind of, you, can, you can kind of manipulate the left side of the pelvis, the right side of the pelvis until it's absolutely perfect. And then you can put your screws in. So it's a way of reducing the pelvis minimally invasively. It works really nicely. But aside from that, because that's one of the minutiae I said, what I wanted to get to you was the, this idea of correcting the pelvic displacement in two planes. So going back to that inlet outlet thing I was boring on about earlier on, here we go. This is the normal side of the pelvis. Can you see right here? See there? That's what it should look like, but not on this side. On this side, we've got, it comes there, it stops, and then it restarts again over here with that step I was showing you earlier on, right? So how are we gonna correct that? Well, we've locked off this side of the pelvis here. See those two pins there? Those are the ones stabilizing the right side of the pelvis. And now we pull on the left side and what happens? There we go, you pull forwards, ah, hooray, it's it's now reduced. Now look, ah, oh, lovely line coming across, all looks good. Um, the two sides are symmetrical, and so we can now shoot our screw through, our screws through, boom. Ah, oh, oh, hang on, hang on a second. Uh, what about the outlet view? Sorry, we have, rewind, rewind. Okay, what have we got on this view? Same thing, you've got that displacement. This is the normal side, like that. This side, it goes burp and then stops, and then restarts again up there. See that? What's this guy up here? Who's this dude? What is that? That is actually the equivalent of this guy. It's the transverse process of L5, who in a vertical shear, because you have iliolumbar ligaments, the ilium is attached to the lumbar spine to, uh, to, to the transverse processes. So if you have a big vertical shear, it often rips off the transverse process in the in in the in the process. Um, so there's our vertical shear. You can really see it nicely now coming down through there. And there's the that's that bit belongs down there. Okay, so we again you can see we've got these two pins on the right side, this guy and this guy. And we're gonna those are now the, the right side of the pelvis is now fixed to the table. We now pull on the left side. What happens? It comes down. You can see that L5 process like hanging in the breeze. It now looks perfect, doesn't it? and we can shoot our screws. And you see the top screw, can you see what is, you can see the uh, S1, see that little frame in there? Boop, boop. That's where the S1 nerve comes out. That's where the S1 nerve comes out. That guy there is where the S2 nerve comes out. And that one there is where the S2 nerve comes out. Yeah? And those look great, don't they? So they, and the screws are kind of missing them. See how they're, they're, they're um, the screws are kind of missing those holes. And so they're not hitting the nerve roots. So they're all safe and the pelvis is now fixed. So that's why talking about pelvic reduction is correcting the pelvis in two planes. Okay, so that's pelvic reduction and pelvic fixation. So I just kind of wanted to throw that in there because of people, we often talk about resuscitation after pelvic fracture and that occupies a lot of bandwidth. Uh, and that is the same talk I gave to the orthopedic group about two or three weeks ago. So I didn't want to repeat that. So I'm talking about pelvic fixation here, but let's talk about some other orthopedic stuff while we're here. And one of the biggest things in orthopedics is fragility fractures. Because if you go on Google and you put elderly people, you get pictures like this cropping up. And you know, there are a whole bunch of really healthy older patients. I totally get it. But there are also a very large cohort of people who have falls from standing height. Yeah, falls from standing height. And uh, so these are low energy falls, but they result in fragility fractures. What does a fragility fracture mean? 
it means basically it's a fracture that that wouldn't normally happen in one of you guys. I guess that what, what it means. If I pushed one of you over and you landed with an outstretched hand, you wouldn't break your wrist usually. But if you do, but uh, an older person might break their wrist or their pelvis or their hip, which wouldn't normally happen. And therefore that's a fragility fracture. So a fragility fracture, you can define as one that arises from a low energy fall from standing height. And this brings me onto the topic of osteoporosis. So next poll question, the one on osteoporosis, bring it up. What have we got? Which of the following statements is untrue about osteoporosis? This is a terrible question, but just, just run with me on this one. Which of the following statements is untrue about osteoporosis? A lot of people considering this answer. It's a good spread. I like it. Getting there. Okay. I'm, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to stop there. I'm going to end the poll. Here we go. Okay, lovely. So this is what we got. So uh, you're all agreed there's a reduction in bone density. Totally agree. There's a reduction in bone strength. There definitely is a reduction in bone strength. Of course there is, because when people fall over, they break their bones more easily. So there's definitely a reduction in bone strength. So it's down to the bottom two. Um, there's a reduction in the amount of bone, but the architecture is maintained. Let's see. I love it. Let's clear out that, that guy. Let's see whether that's true or not. Osteoporosis does result in a reduced bone density and reduced bone strength. So this may not work on, on over Zoom, but I'm going to run it anyway. On the left, you've got, a, you've got two femoral heads, and this is called a micro CT. On the left side is a normal, well, it's actually not a normal, it's actually a, a patient who's got osteoporosis. And it's a fly through, through an osteoporotic femoral head. I don't know whether this projects well or not, but if I freeze it, there, for example, <clears throat> what I want you to get from that picture is the density of the tri trabeculae. Yeah, the trabeculae are quite thick, but they're also quite dense, aren't they? All right, next up, I'll take you to this guy. Same thing. This is an osteo, this is a femoral head taken from a patient who has osteoporosis. There are two things to notice. Number one, you can see that the, look at the individual trabeculae. Do you see how they're much, much thinner than the other ones? But the other critical element is to notice there are big holes, aren't there? There are gaping great big holes in the, the bone. What about this guy here? Whoa, look at that guy. And look how, check out this one. I've used this as an example. Check out this little, oopsie, sorry. Check out this trabeculae right here. Can you see that? This guy here, he's kind of sticking out and he's been left behind, hasn't he? It's like all the bones melted away from, from, right away from him. Look over here, you can see there's a big hole in the, um, uh, in, in the bone. <coughs> this is a bridge. This is a, this is a, a, it's a bit of a classic, this one. It's a classic design of bridge. I don't know anything about bridges, but I'm assured by the internet <laughs> that this is a, a quite a classic design of bridge, all right? So I want you to, 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 in your head, build that bridge out of matchsticks. Okay, there you go. You've done it. Well done. Great job. You've built that very bridge out of matchsticks. Now, I would, I can imagine you would now want to show off to your, to your, um, to your friends and buddies about how strong that bridge is. Do you think it's strong or not? Strong or not strong? Do you really think that's particularly strong? Yeah, it's awesomely strong. Look at that. Check it out. Like this is you in your front room loading house bricks up on your bridge and you're like, yeah, baby, look at that. But I ask you now, if I now gave you, do you see on the bench there? Do you see on the bench there is a pair of, can you shut that door, darling? Uh, see on the bench, there's a pair of clippers just there, yeah? 
what would it take if you started cutting some of those little struts, some of the little struts of the um, bridge, you started cutting them, started clipping them, what would happen? it wouldn't take very long before those bricks would come crashing down and make a hole in your floor, right? So the strength of this bridge is partly related to the glue and the matchsticks and all of that, but it is also very strongly caught up or bound up in the arrangement of the struts, yeah? And bone has, is made up trabecularly. They're all lined up along the lines of force. And so if you start taking out struts, Yes, it reduces your bone density because you've lost bone, but as on top of that, it reduces your, it, it, it spoils the architecture of your bone. So the correct answer was, it's not just a quantitative reduction in bone quality, it is a qualitative reduction as well, in, the, in, the, in that you're losing architecture of your bone as well, okay? And you see it right there, healthy bone, osteoporotic bone. The healthy bone is thicker, but it also has more trabeculae per unit area. It doesn't have those big holes that we saw earlier on. The trouble about holes, you can see this guy here, can't you? Can you see this dude here? He's, oh my gosh, he's hanging on. He's like just hanging on. He's not gonna last much longer. And uh, once it's gone, once the trabeculae is gone, they don't reform. So you can give people medication to make their bone thicker again, to like beef up the bone, but reforming those gone trabeculae doesn't happen so well. All right, so the architecture and the bone density are critical elements. Great, and uh, th this, this is purely to show that we are an aging population. I don't need to bore you with that. And we're living longer. Uh, our life expectancy at birth is going up and up and up. And our life expectancy at the age of 65 is also going up and up and up. Actually, it's not quite true. That bottom graph, for the first time ever, I think it was last year, it flattened off. So our life expectancy at birth has flattened off now, but life expectancy at age 65 is still going up. And this on the right side of your screen is a bone density graph. Um, right, I'm just gonna pause here for a second. What, you, what I'm drawing in here is that red line is at minus 2.5 stand standard deviations below the mean. So uh, down the left-hand side, down, sorry, down this side over here, we've got your so-called T-score. In other words, how many standard deviations uh, around the mean you are? The mean is zero. So that is the mean, whoopsie, that's a terrible line. Let's go for that guy. The mean is here, right? That's the mean uh, of, of uh, the mean, mean uh, where, where you should be, that's like healthy. And then as we go down, uh, you're, you're increasingly osteoporotic. So, sorry, that, that's not there. It should be, whoopsie, it should be there, shouldn't it? That should be at, at zero. So, but that's a mean for a healthy person, okay? That zero should line up with this line. Now then, um, in a healthy person over here, you can see there is a spread of, uh, of distributions. There's a, a spread of people. This is the mean right here. These are the people with really good bone density. These are people with not such good bone density. But even someone who is right down here, yeah, right down there. So really quite osteoporotic for a for a you know for a 30 year old for a 30 year old person. Even for that person, when you track it across, they're still not osteoporotic. The red line I've drawn down there, that is osteoporosis, minus 2.5 devi standard deviations below the mean. Okay, so, but the problem is, this is a bit like the growth chart. So if you start off here, what will happen to you is over time, particularly if you're a woman, you will hit menopause and you will go down here and you'll almost certainly end up being this person here. You tend to follow the bone density graph. You don't go here and then like end up over here somewhere. That doesn't really happen. Um, incidentally, this isn't not this is not females only. Men men go through this decline as well. You know, after the age of forty or fifty. So once you hit forty, your bone has stopped regenerating. Stopped like like it's not stopped regenerating. It has stopped growing. So uh, beyond the age of like 35, 40 odd, you are your bone is now 
wasting away, so to speak. It's whittling away slowly over time. So the times to gain bone are in your 20s and 30s. Okay, so what happens? To, and, and I just want you to put that 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 graph in your in your in your head. So all of these people here, this is the important thing. All of these people here have osteoporosis. All of those people. Yeah. So check it out. If you're 85, yeah, 85 year olds, whoopsie. Of all 85 year olds, you can see the vast majority of them are osteoporotic. Sorry, not vast majority, almost half of them. Sorry, I'm getting myself confused. Almost half of those people have osteoporosis. 90 year olds, over half of them have osteoporosis. And 100 year olds, you know, it's well over half. So osteoporosis is a normal thing. It's not a disease. It's a normal thing in the over 80s. It's kind of like just part of, it's part and parcel. Half of them have it, half of them don't. A decline in bone mass over, over the years is totally normal. Okay. I'm just gonna stop there and bring up a poll. So tell me, how do, uh, what about bisphosphonates? Can you drag that up? How do bisphosphonates work? Oh, okay. Eighty percent are going with inhibiting osteoclasts. Yeah, I like it. I like it. Keep going, keep going, that's good. Oh man, the osteoclasts are winning, I think. I think we can end the poll. I think we can end the poll, that's great. Nice one, okay, they totally inhibit it. And that's, that's absolutely right, they totally inhibit osteoclasts. That's absolutely right. So what happens with um, with uh, bisphosphonates is they don't, they, they, they circulate through the butt, they get taken up by the bone. So the, the, the bisphosphonates get absorbed into the bone itself. And then when the osteoclast comes in and munches the bone out, uh, it takes up the bisphosphonates, which kind of poison it. They go, <laughs> it's like eating, like eating gone off soup or something. And they go, oh God, I, I'm, and they, I'm, I'm, they basically become sessile and they stop, they stop chomping. So bisphosphonates poison the osteoclasts by sitting in the bone and, um, and stopping them. That's how they work. Okay. This diagram basically is a bit complicated. So I'm just gonna walk you through it very, very slowly. You will know a lot of this already, but what I've got here are three cell, three cell types. We've got the osteocyte. Yep, that, that guy there, that's these dudes and they are sitting in the bone. The green bit here is the bone, right? So they're sitting in the bone. They're kind of marooned inside. They can't move around. They're kind of like completely surrounded by bone. Look how they hold hands with each other. They do actually hold hands with each other. They're almost like a, you know, like a like a syncytium, if you like. They're all kind of connected through gap junctions. So they do communicate, but they are, uh, but they and they're alive, uh, but they are they can't move at all. And that's an osteocyte. All right. You think of your osteoblast. He's kind of the commander in chief, if you like. The osteoblast is the guy who creates bone. So he's the guy who lays down bone. He lays down this stuff called osteoid which is a, like a protein matrix. And then the osteoid gets mineralized outside the cell. And then that, 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 that is bone. Mineralized osteoid or osteoid is bone. And then you've got your osteoclast, who is the dude who breaks down the bone. He's massive, isn't he? He's multinucleate. He's like a massive juggernaut. And he basically digs out bone, all right? And the way he does that is twofold. He's got two, he's got two things going on. He's got this ruffled border down the bottom, and that, and that secretes two things. Number one, acid phosphatase. In other words, it creates an acid environment, uh, hydrogen ions, which, uh, which, caught, which basically dissolve the mineral, the calcium carbonate, calcium sulfate. And they have protease, one of which is cathepsin K, cat K, which basically breaks down the protein. So like you know, the, the, um, the collagen. So, because bone is made up of mineral and collagen. The mineral is the calcium, the collagen is the, is, the, is the protein. The acid breaks down the mineral, the uh, 
cathepsin K breaks down the, is one, one of the enzymes to break down the protein. Okay, so that's basically that. How is it regulated? Well, uh, let me start you over here in the osteoblast. The osteoblast has these things going, I don't wanna get too swept away with this. He has this thing called rank L, and rank L is, is, a, is, a, is a messenger on the, on the edge of the osteoblast, which binds to rank on the osteoclast. And basically rank L makes, stimulates rank and says, go, go, go. So osteoblasts turn on oste <coughs> osteoclasts. That's how they work. Rank L says to rank, go, go, go. And so the osteoclast forms more osteoclasts and off it goes and they start munching. However, there's obviously a feedback because there's always a feedback, right? And this is a stuff called OPG, osteopetegrin. There's osteopetegrin right there, which is, which is, and that is also produced by the osteoblast. Yeah, the osteoblast produces its own osteopetegrin, which competitively binds to rank L, there it is, and therefore stops it going on to rank. And so that effectively turns off the osteoclast, okay? Nice. So that's the basic fundamentals of this. There are some other complexities. There's this stuff called sclerostin, this stuff here. And sclerostin uh, is uh, inhibitory, inhibitory to this dude over here. This is really quite new stuff, the Wnt pathway. The Wnt pathway, basically you've got Wnt all over your body, Wnt uh, in your liver, Wnt in your kidney, Wnt all over the shop. What Wnt is, is like an anabolic, uh, pathway. And so if you stab someone in the liver, they will start expressing wint to, to recover that. If you have, if you stub, you know, like you have an, a lung in your, injury in your lung, you start getting wint uh, being expressed to regenerate that bit of lung. And the same is true in bone. The regenerative stimulatory element of forming new bone is the wint pathway. And sclerostin, which is made by the osteocytes, is inhibitory, stops it down, let, slows it down. So scrost is bad, 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 okay? Uh, there are other things, there's estrogen, and we'll come to these in just a minute, there's estrogen receptors, there's parathyroid hormone receptors, there's calcitonin receptors, and there's estrogen receptors over here. So there's lots of other players involved. I'm just gonna walk you through this really quickly, because um, I think this is stuff, this is bone regulation is kind of relevant to pharmacology. This is this next one is basically a uh, is oh what happened there what happened there no 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 sorry there we go so uh, that is a hugely complicated slide and I'm going to walk you through the five corners of this very very quickly uh, Terry Peritide is a PTH analog. So what that does is it pretends to be PTH and what that does is it stimulates the osteoblast and it has the effect of effectively has the, it actually stimulates both osteoblast and osteoclast, but it's more on the osteoblast side. And so it ends up being good for bone. Teriparatide, it's anabolic and it makes your, uh, increases your bone turnover. It gives you more bone. There's various other things. There's stuff called denosunab which as you can tell by the, the, the MAB bit is an, auto, is an antibody against rank L. So effectively it, it, it binds to rank L, acts a bit like osteopetegrin. And so it leaves rank hanging and therefore uh, it, it's, um, it, it, it basically shuts down the osteoclasts. Similarly, calcitonin. Calcitonin, you get a calcitonin uh, analog which blocks this, this receptor. Again, that will shut down uh, osteoclasts. Here are the uh, bisphosphonates, the BPs. Remember that? We, that was in the question. Bisphosphonates get taken up by the bone. They get gobbled up by the osteoclast and it poisons them. Ah, disgusting. And the osteoclast shuts down. So there's lots of drugs that target the osteoclast specifically, and those are them. Next, we've got strontium. What does strontium do? Strontium, again, is a bit like a bisphosphonate in the sense that it gets taken up by the bone. Here it is, gets taken up by the bone and it then stimulates, stimulates the osteoblast. So by, by these calcium strontium receptors, it stimulates the osteoblast and it's anabolic. Uh, similarly, raloxifene is an estrogen analog, which, which, um, woo, is an estrogen analog, um, which again uh, forces 
uh, which again forces the uh, 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 is stimulatory to the to the uh, osteoblast. Going across, you've got um, you've got cathepsin K inhibitors, which inhibit the which again target the osteoclast to stop it from breaking down bone. And similarly, you've got these things anti sclerostin antibodies that basically block the uh, the sclerostin and stop it from inhibiting the Wnt pathway. Wnt is good. Wnt is anabolic and like exciting, and so uh, sclerostin blocks. Uh, uh, anti sclerostin is a good thing. Great. So overall, there are tons of, and I'm getting to the point here now. <laughs> there are tons of options, drugs available, and a lot of these are in you know in in development de development now. But fundamentally bisphosphonates remain the standard of care bisphosphonates remain the standard of care for 98 percent of patients with osteoporosis because they're cheap they're effective and nothing else has really proven to be much much more cost effective than them at the current time they're incredibly cheap so i'm going to take you back to this diagram and I, I, this will hopefully make sense now look at those treatment options for osteoporosis the non-pharmacological and the pharmacological see how they are all almost all of them are targeted at those patients who already have who already have or are about to have osteoporosis in other words these guys down here yeah that's where it's targeting but no one is targeting the people who are up here. The people that we know ultimately will drift down here and end up having osteoporosis at the age of uh, 65 or whatever. We're not, we're not targeting those. Uh, and so the only thing that does target them is hormone replacement therapy, which you tend to give around about age of about 50 odd. So when you're about this sort of age. So HRT is kind of preemptive. All of the other ones are post-reactionary you're treating the condition by which time you've lost a lot of those cross bridges a lot of that architecture is already gone yes you can build back some of that bone density but you can't get back the architecture so and i'm not trying to be bleak here but there's no real awesome breakthrough in treatment in sight at the moment uh, uh, the best thing for osteoporosis is to prevent it and we don't have a great prevention strategy honestly um Proximal femur fractures. So osteoporosis is best exemplified by the fractured neck of femur, the proximal femur fracture. There it is, right there. So, come on then. Last, last um, uh, thing. We're entering the last five minutes of the talk now. Give me uh, the last, the last poll. What are we going to treat this with? What do we treat that fracture with? I'll tell you what it is in a minute. What implant are we going to treat this with? Sliding hip screw, sliding medullary screw. That's like a like a nail with a slate. Uh, thing through it hemi or total arthroplasty i can tell you this patient is pretty fit and well otherwise fit and well she's 65 and she's fallen over and broken her hip she's pretty good pretty good oh this is close this is close oh man okay this is close. Oh, okay. Should we shut it down there? Okay. So the, the correct answer, this is an intertrochanteric uh, fracture. So it's extra capsular. Yeah. So the capsule, you can get rid of the pole. Um, so the majority of people went through sliding hip screw. That's fine. Um, it's extra capsule. You can remember the capsule of the, of, the, of the hip comes in about there. So the blood supply to this femoral head comes in here and goes in like that. Comes up here and goes in like that. So if your intra capsule, if your fracture is, is inside the capsule, then that, that blood supply is disrupted. If you are outside the capsule, which this fracture is, then you, the blood supply to your femoral head is preserved and therefore you fix the fracture rather than replace it. So here we go. Uh, And you treat it with one of those two devices. The one on the left is a sliding hip screw because it's a plate and screws. And the one on the right is an intramedullary sliding hip screw. Uh, uh, and, and so either of those was the correct answer. Okay, next one, been easier this time. 
What are we going to treat that one with? I'm not, I don't want to do a poll because I've shown you. <laughs> this is what you call an intracapsular fracture. So this is it's not a very good x-ray. It doesn't show it very nicely, but intracapsular energy. In other words, that one that happens right underneath the ball, one that happens, if I show you on here, one that happens around about this level, we tend to throw those in the bin because they're, they're likely not, unless it's a very young person, uh, you know, someone under the age of like 45, you generally... Um, uh, you generally throw the head in the bin because you assume it's going to die and you, you treat it with a, either a hip, a full hip, a hemiarthroplasty, which is what that is, bottom, bottom right, uh, or a total hip replacement where you, you put in a socket as well. If it's an, a young, like, a, like a, I say young, someone who's fit and active and walks to the shops and is kind of really good, uh, good, has good mobility beforehand, you tend to give them a total hip replacement. If it's someone who's very elderly and frail and you just want a quick, quick operation, you tend to give her a hemi. Great. But osteoporosis is not just hip fractures. There are fragility fractures all over the body. This is your classic, you know, Collie's fracture with a, with a, with a dinner fork deformity. This is a proximal humerus fracture affecting the shoulder. This is a spine fracture with a, with a collapse of, 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 of uh, you know, the thoracic vertebrae. And you get the fractures of the distal femur, of the ankle, around the knee, the tibial plateau. You have osteoporotic insufficiency fractures all over the place. And you also get them in the pelvis. And it's a global, for, well, it's, I say global, it's global in the sense that of, of the Western world. It, actually, in Africa, where people are well exposed to sunlight, it's much, much less common. Um, but in the Western world, we're increasingly not getting much sunshine because we're indoors all day. And we, are, we, we don't eat much vitamin D. We're not particularly healthy in terms of our diet. But sun is the thing that gives you the most vitamin D. Uh, you can get pelvic fractures. I'll whistle through this. You can get pelvic fractures in the elder, so-called pubic ramus fractures. And you can see there's a pubic ramus down there. This was just sustained from a, a fall from a standing height. The thing about else, a, a so-called lateral compression type one, uh, they tend to be falls from standing height, older patients, more common in females, and they are painful, but they're stable injuries. So we, and they do tend to heal. So we generally treat them non-operatively. But the, the funny thing about these is that they, although you treat them non-op, they, they do have this this horrible pain and immobility in, in while they're healing up uh, and they get, and they, so they can get chest infections and uh, pressure sores and VTEs, et cetera, while they're, while they're in hospital um, getting going and they get that critical loss of confidence, loss of their independence. And that's one of the big things when elderly folk fall over and sustain an injury is a loss of confidence. They have a step down in their general level of mobility because they lose their confidence. Uh, and sometimes the bone is so frail, they, this 88 year old lady, she broke her pelvis sitting down on a chair. Seriously, that's how, that's how frail the bone can get. There's a fracture going up through there. There's a fracture going up through there that you can see there's a fracture coming through here. Um, and all of that from just sitting down hard on a chair. It's incredible. Um, and I'll breeze past me and see if we fix that with the Nymphix because she was just in so much pain that we gave her some stability that way. Um, uh, and acetabular fractures, I, I've kind of breezed over these because I haven't really mentioned them, but acetabular like hip socket fractures in the elderly are a big deal because you can imagine how disabling this one is. You can see on the left side here, you've got um, a normal looking hip. On the right side, you can see there is a, you know, there's a, the, the whole hip, the hip, hip's kind of imploded as it exploded inwards. Um, uh, again, fall from standing height tends to be low energy. Um, uh, and look at the damage to that femoral head. Can you see how the femoral head comes round? There it goes, brrr, comes, the femoral head comes round here, round here, gets to there, and then it goes, uh, uh, goes in, and, and it, where, where it's been impaled on the acetabular on the inside. So although we've, we've kind of reduced it, if you like, we've put it back where it belongs, it's really badly damaged. And so almost certainly that patient's gonna end up with a hip replacement. There are various ways you can treat these, and I'm not going to go into these in any detail, but uh, you can treat them non optimally You treat patients with no surgery at all. Uh, this patient's had a hip replacement on the left. Ignore that. On the right side, they had an acetabular fracture, a bit like the one you just saw, and it was treated non optimally Now you can see the hip, oopsie, ah, oh, damn, he's doing that. And now you can see the, uh, the hip on this side is uh, completely there's the hip, it's completely inside the pelvis, isn't it? It's almost resting up against the sacrum. Um, uh, so non-op can, can be not great, 
This is a percutaneous fixation. You can treat acetabular fracture with percutaneous fixation or just fixing with some screws to make them comfortable. But actually this patient, it really didn't work. And they ended up uh, getting, getting up, ending up like medializing and getting arthritis and they ended up with hip replacement anyway. So percutaneous, you can do it, but it's not as strong as fixing it with metal plates and screws, which is formal internal fixation. So that's a, that is a great technique if your femoral head's not too badly damaged, is fixing it. But you can see that was a big operation, right? There's a big open approach and we did a big pelvic surgery on there. So in a very elderly, frail person, that is, that's a big thing to do to someone. Um, and obviously, if, you, if you're that patient we saw earlier with that big femoral head damage, that is not going to work because even though you fix them, they're still going to end up with, with arthritis. So more and more now, particularly in the elderly population, we're moving to arthroplasty, in other words, total hip replacement for these uh, nasty acetabular fractures. And uh, so you, we sometimes do what's called fix and replace. So you fix it and then you replace it. And it ends up with a bit of a crazy looking x-ray with like, oh my God, loads of metal work because you put plates in to begin with to stabilize it. And then you put a hip replacement in straight afterwards to stabilize it. But but it totally works. There's loads of technology around this, around trabecular metal, which like attracts the bone and makes it grow into it really, really solidly. And you've got special ways to stop it dislocating like this thing called dual mobility, whereby you've kind of got two articulations, one with, with the plastic on the metal and one with the metal on the plastic. And it kind of like, it's, it's called dual mobility and it's what it, what it does is re strongly resists dislocation. And here you go, here's, here's a lady who's had a fix and replace just three weeks previously. There she is, zooming up and down the corridor. And uh, you know, you wouldn't really know it, but she, that, she just three weeks ago, she had that operation. That, 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 the fix you just saw is her x-ray. And she's like, she's complaining about uh, the, the hospital food, etc. So in summary, Bony corridors in the pelvis. That's what I was talking about, those screws. You can put the sacroiliac screws. You can put like, down the anterior, posterior column. There. Bony corridors in the pelvis you can use to fix the pelvic ring. Open versus percutaneous techniques. Open are great but uh, for visualizing things, but they do come at the cost of potential wound infection. So we prefer percutaneous if you can do it. Inlet versus outlet views. That's how we work out whether a pelvis is displaced or not. I don't know about crisis is a word people love to use, but osteoporosis is a thing that's getting worse, not better. We are getting older and older and older and older as a population, but we're still getting osteoporosis in the same way. It's not like the, the onset of osteoporosis is getting later and later. It's not. It's happening at the same time. So we haven't really got, other than HRT for, for ladies, uh, we haven't really got a good preventative treatment for osteoporosis. And I talked about the options for acetabular fractures in terms of like going from right the way from the spectrum of non-operative treatment, right the way through to very aggressive fix and replace, uh, which obviously is a big hit for the patient and carries a complication profile, but does give you amazing results. Brilliant. That is my talk exactly on one hour, I think. So I, I, I think we're just about to pull that back despite my technical issues. Yep. Thank you uh, very much, Mr. Vance. <laughs> I wish I had you as my lecturer, not gonna lie. Um, attendees, please ask the questions in the Q&A um, function box. My, my apologies for, uh, my apologies for, uh, uh, <laughs> no my apologies for, for the, A, for the technical problems, but B, for the, um, for, for uh, not having more Q&A, but more, more questions along the way. If I thought earlier, I would have, I would have set more questions and we could have uh, had a bit more fun with those. I'll no ask worries. some really stupid questions. <laughs> so, um, yeah, this is the feedback form. This is the QR code uh, link to the feedback form. Um, please consider can doing... I, can I take a, a shot and like, give myself some awesome feedback? Uh, yeah. <laughs> okay. Let's see. Um, yes. Cheers for that. That's very kind. Cheers, Elliot. Any, go on, give me not don't 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 say thank you say say uh, give, give me a question give me even a stupid <laughs> question i don't care i don't know no more no more thank yous give me some uh, give me some questions yep we have a question here so in which situations would you use an im nail rather than a dhs 
Oh yeah, okay, yeah, I like that. So, um, uh, that's a good question, actually. And the, the answer is it's hugely controversial. That one, it's really, really controversial. And some people prefer DHS, and some people prefer nails. The honest truth is, there's no, there's no proof. There's no carbon cast iron proof that nails are superior. So actually DHS is just as effective as nails in all the trials that have been done. And boy, that because a DHS was invented back in 1961 or something, like they are cheap as chips. You can make one in your garage. They literally cost about 50 quid to make a DHS. Whereas a nail costs more like 500 quid. So, or maybe, no, it's more like 900 quid. So the, the, the cost differential between the two is about, is it's over 10 times more expensive for a nail. But nonetheless, some people just love nails because they kind of feel better and they're a bit more sexy, et cetera. So uh, it's, it's very, very controversial that. But, but um, the, the only thing uh, that nails are definitely better for, exactly as you say, is for subtrochanteric fractures where the nail is definitely superior. But for intertrochanteric fractures, like the one I showed, DHS is probably the go-to. Okay. Cemented versus another, uncemented. Okay, uh, I have another question about um, why a dynamic hip screw is used for intertrochanteric and intramedullary nail for subtrochanteric um, fracture. Just, yeah, it's just, the clinical, just the clinical results is that for, for intertrochanteric fractures, uh, a DHS has worked really, really well since 1961. It's still doing well. And there have been multiple, multiple randomized controlled trials comparing nails to, to DHS, intramedullary to extramedullary. And they, no one has managed to show uh, superiority of nails. So actually, uh, it, for, for intertrochanteric, for subtrochanteric, there's very, very compelling evidence that the nails are superior. So, uh, cemented versus uncemented. Yeah. Okay. Um, uh, the advantages of cement, one of the advantages of cement, two, two big advantages. Number one, um, it's, it's got antibiotics in it, so it's less likely to get infected. So it's got like gentamicin inside, which, which kills off bugs. So that reduces your infection rate. So it's less likely to get infected. So that's one good reason. The other thing about uncemented, the way uncemented work is you, it works is you like, it, here's your, you've got your long tube of your femur and you're jamming this thing into it. And in order for uncemented to work, you've got to whack it in quite tight. It's got to get a good grip fit in order to work. Now, ultimately, what happens is the bone ends up like bonding to it, so it almost like it like ends up, you know, anchored to the bone. But that takes like six weeks or so. It doesn't happen like instantly. And so, uh, you want it to grip really well to begin with. And what can happen, particularly very fragile bones, you go whack, 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 ooh, and you break the femur as you put the uncemented in. So uncemented have a slightly higher complication rate because you have more fractures when you're putting it in. So people generally prefer some uncemented for just everyday work because it's safer, less likely to crack the femur, and it delivers antibiotics. But uncemented is, and also uncemented is a bit more expensive. Um, so some people prefer uncemented because it's quicker. <laughs> so if you're late, if you're, if you're a bit impatient, uh, you tend to go for uncemented, but uh, cemented is probably superior. Yep. Uh, when is the orthopedics developing in the next 10 to 15 years? Well, uh, if Ronald is happy to give me uh, another uh, go at this, uh, this thing, I'll, I'll tell you about the future of orthopedics. But where is it developing in the next 10 to 15 years? I think it's going to be governed by two things. Number one, osteoporosis. I, as I told you, I mean, that's why I brought that up is because I think that is one thing that's going to strongly color the future of of um, uh, you know, of, of, you know, of, of injury. It's one of you know, it's the biggest disease ever. Because like uh, over over seventies, almost half, half the population have got it, and um, and so so and, and we haven't really nailed it yet. And the other thing I think is going to be uh, driverless cars. I think it's going to be absolutely massive when they come in because all of these road traffic accidents, motorcyclists, cyclists, all these people get injured by cars. I was driving badly will suddenly turn off and so a lot of the high energy injuries will go away and all these like injuries on building sites and stuff will also go away as robots start like doing the building for you You've got like brick laying machines like could do it much quicker than a man you know once 
uh, that happens over the next 10 to 15 years, I think health and safety will, will, will soar and uh, road safety will become massive. The X-ray with the damaged transverse process due to the fracture, what was done to repair it? Oh, we don't, we don't, we leave it, we leave it be. Transverse process isn't important to the overall stability of the spine or the pelvis. So we just let that fly. We let the transverse process fly. Sometimes they heal back on, usually they don't. But the thing about transverse process fractures is that they are generally not symptomatic in the future. So even if you had one that didn't heal, if I poke you on it like a year later, it doesn't hurt. Lee, please leave the source of that osteoclast blast diagram. Uh, yeah, yeah, sure, sure, sure. Or I'll, I'll, give, I'll give it to Ron and he can circulate it. I'll take, just take a screenshot yep. of it. But the, right. the source of it, ah, if I'm honest, I got it off, I got it off uh, Google, but I, I, can, I can find it, I can find it. Um, we have some question that is typed on the chat as well. And um, how will ask, um, so with the infects for pelvis, um, you mentioned that um, you 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 take it out um, for the young patients when it, when it's healed. Yeah. So do you imply that you you don't take it out for the elderly patient? Yeah, no. How we leave it in? We leave it in uh, for, for for the elderly. That's true. But young people, it really it's really annoying. They, they like it's kind of it's it's right here, and you've got the uh, lateral cutaneous nerve of the thigh, which comes down over there and supplies an area of skin over the lateral aspect of your thigh. And a lot of those patients, you know, one of the complications of that operation is impingement of the lateral cutaneous nerve of the thigh. You've probably heard of neuralgia parasthetica, which is that condition where people get pinching of the uh, LCN uh, and they get this tingling over their anterolateral thigh, same, same sort of symptoms as that. And they, so for young patients, we almost always take them out. Older patients, it's a bit more floppy and the skin kind of hangs around it and it, it just doesn't bother them so much. So we tend to leave them in. But if yep. it's bothering them, then, then, they, then we take them out. And we have another question from Harlow. Yeah, but Rachel, I'm not quite sure. Well, thank you, thank you. <laughs> it's okay, it's all right. I forgive you. How um, uh, do you think uh, that will mean trauma surgeons will be out of work? <laughs> no, we won't be out of work because people will always do stupid things. People would always want to fight with each other, like guns and like knives and like, like beating people up. And people will always trip over and do stupid things like riding their bikes down hills, go and fall off their skateboard, etc. So I just think that trauma surgery is going to become a bit boring over the next 20, 20 years. Because mm -hmm. all the really cool high energy stuff will kind of go away, except people trying to kill themselves. Oh man, we get loads of that. People jumping off buildings, jumping in front of cars, jumping off bridges. We see a lot of that. So I think the job of a trauma surgeon, I don't think it'll, it'll go away. It'll just, the case mix will change. So it'll be instead of, you know, uh, you know pedestrian versus car or car versus car or car versus lorry, because I think those will all go away. It will be man trying to kill himself, uh, Woman fell off a bike, uh, and uh, you know, uh, uh, people assaulting each other. Yep, I think we have the one last question in the Q and A function box. Um, so, uh, Sophie is wondering if there's any trial looking at um, biphosphates um, or the drug in younger patients with low um, low bone density, and no. try to prevent them no. with. No, because okay. no, no, because because no, because none of these drugs are a free lunch. Even bisphosphates, they're cheap as chips, but they're not a free lunch. They come with with complications, and the main complications with bisphosphates is they turn off osteoclasts. And if you turn off osteoclasts, you can't remodel your bone, and that means you end up getting these little stress fractures slowly, slowly over the years, propagating through your through your bones, particularly in the proximal femur. You get these things called atypical fractures or bisphosphonate fractures. They're basically they're caused by the bis because you've been on bisphosphonate for like you know like two or three years, you end up getting a fracture as a result of them. It's not the same sort of fracture. It's almost like the bone's too hard, uh, but you get stress fractures coming through because you can't, the osteoclasts are important because they remodel your bone. And any stress fractures that come through, they kind of gobble it up and, they and then the osteoblasts fill the space in with new bone. And that's how your bones remodel. And that's how, how 
how you know you can go and play you can play rugby all season or you can go rock climbing all season and you don't end up getting stress fractures afterwards because your bone is constantly remodeling okay thanks so much thank you for spending a friday afternoon with us today thank it's you great. very much for your for the presentation awesome um, well, i'll, I'll send these I'm... yeah Oh, Thank you so much for inviting me. I'm really, really honoured, and it's 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 a real pleasure to teach teach you guys because you're always such a good audience. But thank you very okay. much for inviting me.